Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Banyan Tree Leadership Forum at CSIS. Thank you for joining us for this important presentation today. My name is Ernie Bauer. I'm the Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asia Program here, as well as our brand new uh, Pacific Partners Initiative. I lead that program with my colleague, Dr. Mike Green, and it's the first program at a major Washington, D.C. think tank focused exclusively on Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Island countries. We're honored to have on hand one of the people who inspired us to initiate that new program here as our honored speaker today, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, Kurt Campbell. Kurt, thanks for joining us. We're lucky to have Kurt with us today. He's leaving for Auckland, New Zealand, to help the largest, to help lead the largest ever United States delegation to the Pacific Islands Forum. And I hope, as a fellow rugby player and avid fan, that he's got a ticket for the All Blacks uh, Tonga game that kicks off the uh, 2011 Rugby World Cup in Auckland this Friday. Uh, Kurt has been a leader, uh, as you know, of U.S. policy uh, in Southeast Asia and Asia and the Asia Pacific generally during his tenure at the State Department. His strategic thinking coupled with his intense commitment and high energy have combined to deliver impressive results. His leadership on a proactive and engaged U.S. foreign policy is well known both here in the United States, in the United States, and certainly across Asia. And I think you'll agree that Kurt's actions uh, speak louder than any words I could use to introduce him today. So without further ado, I'd like you to join me in welcoming our, our uh, guest speaker today, the Honorable Kurt Campbell. Uh, thank you very much, Ernie, and it's great to see so many friends in the audience and very grateful to be back at CSIS. I want to say how pleased we are that this program is underway. Um, the work that Ernie, that John Hamry, uh, that uh, Mike Green and others have done to advance not only uh, our thinking and understanding of the developments in Asia, but particularly the work on Southeast Asia and now on the Pacific and Australia and New Zealand, I think helps uh, complement uh, the concept of a totality in terms of our comprehensive approach to the Asian Pacific region in which countries like India, uh, uh, even in Latin America, are playing a larger role in this dynamic region. Today I'm here to talk to you about uh, the Pacific. And one of the things that you find when you talk about the Asia Pacific, um, many friends in the Pacific will tell you that in that uh, shorthand, it is the second word that gets short shrift that there is enormous focus on uh, Asia, but not enough focus on the Pacific. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we have tried to do over the course of the last few years is do a comprehensive assessment, almost an accounting of where we stand in the Asian Pacific region, in the Pacific, and think about what we need to do in terms of going forward. Um, I had the great good fortune this summer of traveling on a uh, multi-agency trip throughout the Pacific in which we hit um, 10 islands in about uh, a week and a half, led by Admiral Walsh, our very able uh, sink pack fleet, but also with friends uh, from uh, USAID and the Department of Defense as well. I think it would be fair to say that what we have found uh, over the course uh, of the last couple of years is a twof uh, twofold uh, uh, set of truths. One is that the United States continues to have enduring strategic, political, uh, moral uh, interests uh, in the Pacific. Uh, they uh, date back to before uh, uh, the Second World War, um, and they will continue and they endure. Uh, I think the second thing that at least I have discovered personally is a general disappointment with the lack of performance on the part of the United States and indeed other countries in terms of implementing our overall game plan in the Pacific and a deep recognition that we need to do better and we need to better uh, work together in terms of ensuring uh, greater coordination on a variety of issues, but also reflect more honestly about what some of the nature of the challenges are that we are facing in the Pacific as a whole. So what I thought I would do is give you kind of our overall assessment of what we find as we look at the Pacific and then try to give you 
uh, a glimpse of what our strategy is going forward, what we want to uh, achieve, what we think some of the inhibitions are of success, some of the challenges uh, that we face, and sort of an overall recognition of some of the limitations, both in terms of resources and also, obviously, an extraordinarily full foreign policy national security uh, agenda. So I think we began, uh, if you look over the course of the last 20 years, a fairly uh, dramatic uh, uh, scene setter, uh, a reduction in U.S. assistance, cutting back uh, on our diplomatic outposts in the Pacific, a consolidation around a couple of key islands, challenges in terms of uh, 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 democracy and uh, uh, the uh, stability of, of governments in the Pacific. If you look at the Pacific, many respects the the, the hinge, the, uh, the um, overall transportation economic links basically are built around Fiji with the developments in Fiji has made it very difficult to do the kind of consequential uh, coordination that we would like to see. Um, I think we've also uh, seen uh, uh, a lack of coordination among some of the key countries who have interests uh, in, in the Pacific. Clearly, uh, the Pacific is in the backyard of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I think it would be fair to say until recently we had not done enough coordination with our allies and friends, and we had not done enough to support them in their important endeavors uh, in the Pacific. But it does not end there. Obviously, Japan, uh, China, Taiwan, the EU, the um, international financial, financial institutions, the multilateral development banks all have extraordinarily uh, developed programs in the Pacific. And in fact, uh, if you look at the Pacific and its challenges, enormous poverty, uh, 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 extraordinarily acute health challenges, uh, a number of problems associated with the environment. Uh, uh, if, you, if you think about climate change, the Pacific really is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, if you travel to the Pacific, particularly low-lying uh, atolls, it is immediately uh, recognizable, uh, some of the effects uh, uh, on their lives and livelihoods. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, we have seen generally is that compared to other very challenged places around the globe, uh, the Pacific actually has a remarkably high level of assistance that is coming in, either directly from the United States government. Some of our monies go through a different mechanism, what are called our compacts with countries that we have enduring security and political relations, uh, uh, given our relationship in Kwajalein and Micronesia and the like, but also from all these various uh, different uh, uh, countries, all of which have bilateral interests in the Pacific as a whole. So we see an environment of just enormous um, uh, challenges uh, spanning uh, every aspect of life. Energy costs are uh, higher in the Pacific than almost any place uh, uh, on the planet. At the same time, uh, remarkably little uh, systematic use of recyclable uh, uh, and other uh, energy technologies. Uh, health problems which are acute, which have led many islanders to leave their homes to seek uh, treatment uh, elsewhere, uh, uh, a set of challenges associated with uh, brain drain uh, that are uh, immediately recognizable from any country uh, in uh, uh, Africa or um, throughout the third world. Um, and so as we, as we scan that environment, one of the things that was also clear on this most recent trip is, is that if you go to any of the Capitol buildings more um, uh, uh, recent uh, uh, structures, you will see black and white pictures of earlier periods of uh, American and other engagement in which we had remarkably more resources to bring to bear. But at the same time, it is possible to glimpse, shall we say, the, um, the, uh, uh, the legacy, uh, sometimes rotting in harbors. Uh, over a period of 30 or 40 years, there have been several efforts to try to bring new patrol boats, for instance, uh, to uh, the Pacific. This is the largest oceanic domain on the planet, millions of miles, some of the most important uh, areas with regard to fisheries. Uh, some of these uh, fisheries are still uh, uh, relatively pristine. They are in, uh, they're at risk. They're at risk of being overfished uh, due to uh, uh, large trawlers coming in illegally into, um, into coastal waters. Um, uh, we have seen a variety of major projects 
uh, that frankly over the course of the last 30, 40 years have failed for a variety of reasons. And so when we took stock, we tried to um, think carefully about how you use scarce resources. How can you be effective given the nature of the challenges uh, that we're facing? And how can we build on our strengths? By an order of magnitude, we are still the most important security player in the Asian Pacific region in terms of our, um, uh, our Navy and our Air Force and also the role of our Coast Guard that plays a remarkably and innovative uh, uh, role uh, in the Pacific as a whole. So our overall game plan uh, is uh, uh, is uh, along these lines. First, we, we sought to really learn from the past, to look carefully at what we had done in the past, see where it had, be, it had been effective, but also recognize that there have been many failed attempts, uh, both in terms of improving health indicators, but also in terms of, for instance, maritime domain awareness and, uh, and the ability for these very small island nations to patrol vast areas of water. So how to think constructively about, again, limited resources, enormous uh, challenges. I think the first thing that we recognized was a need for a substantial institutional re-engagement across a range of both bilateral and multilateral uh, arenas. The first was a decision that uh, Raj Shah and Secretary Clinton made uh, to reintroduce USAID uh, back to the Pacific. Now you could say, well, that's a modest thing, but it's enormously important to our friends uh, in the Pacific. And it is important all the more so given the fact that we are under enormous budget uh, uh, challenges. The fact that with the support of key players on Capitol Hill, there has been a consequential decision to go back to the Pacific and to focus carefully on a range of issues focused on a couple of key areas, climate change, uh, the role of women and girls, and of course, some enduring, enduring problems uh, on the health agenda uh, going forward. And so we're proud of that. It's a modest first step, but again, within the larger backdrop of uh, substantial cuts. I hope friends understand uh, the important nature of this. And what we have found is how many countries, particularly Australia, New Zealand, and other friends in Asia, have said how much they want to coordinate and cooperate with us. And so our goal is to work with other nations, other like-minded and other countries, to ensure that our assistance is better coordinated going forward. So that's the first part of what we might call uh, institutional re-engagement. The second is that the Pacific also has a range of institutions, the most important of which is called the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, one of the things I did not mention, mention at the outset is that what's also immediately uh, 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 available to anyone who spends time in the, in the Pacific is the enormous differences across these islands, different cultures, languages, different approaches. And so they resist and frankly somewhat resent the sense that they are um, thought of as just being all alike as Pacific Island nations. And so we've sought as we engage in institutions like the Pacific Island Forum to work not only as part of a larger group but also have important bilateral inter interactions, particularly with the key island nations. Um, uh, as Ernie was gracious enough to uh, indicate, actually as I leave uh, this afternoon I'll be going as part of uh, Deputy Secretary Nides' largest delegation ever on the part of the United States to the Pacific Island Forum. We'll send about 40 people there from almost every important agency, the State Department, the Coast Guard, the Department of Defense, U.S. Forces, uh, USAID, uh, uh, Interior Department, uh, uh, virtually every, the White House, virtually every agency inside the U.S. government that has a role in how to think about the Pacific, we'll be sending se senior representatives. And we will all be uh, under uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Nides' leadership. And I look forward to helping represent the United States as part of this very substantial delegation. I just want to underscore here what, what the contrast is. Um, six years ago, during the Pacific Island Forum, we had two people there, all right? And so this is really a determination to suggest that we want to bring more resources to bear, but more importantly, we want to coordinate um, inside our government. The other issue that we found as we went through the Pacific is that we dis discovered programs and other initiatives that we had no idea were underway, right? And so when we talk about the Pacific as a whole, we think one of the most important things that could be done 
is a greater uh, degree of what we might call donor uh, or assistance coordination. When we think about that, our first way of thinking about it is along the lines of making sure that countries like China and Taiwan and Japan and France and the EU and Australia and New Zealand and the United States are coordinated uh, more effectively together. That is absolutely essential. And one of the things that Kevin Rudd did in Karn, uh, Khan's, I always pronounce that incorrectly, I apologize, uh, three years ago was to put in place an initiative which is designed to improve our overall coordination. But that's not enough. We actually need to be able to be more effectively coordinated within our own government to actually understand what these disparate programs do and what they're responsible for. The fact of the matter is, unlike many places around the world, the Interior Department is responsible for much of what we do in the Pacific, not the Department of State. And so what we've sought to do over the course of the last couple of years is improve our coordination and understanding of what each of our institutions do uh, in the Pacific as a whole. And so we think that there is enormous potential at, this is not one of those places where there is a substantial gap in resources. In fact, if you look at the collective whole, it is extraordinarily substantial. The challenge is a better degree of coordination, and that coordination has been remarkably difficult, uh, ironically, not only within our government, but with other um, uh, uh, governments as a whole. But we've seen some progress uh, in, recent, um, uh, in the recent period. We've also been struck, frankly, as you travel through the Pacific, there are uh, new uh, uh, indicators of changes in the sort of geopolitical context. In almost every capital, there are large new buildings, many of the, uh, and stadiums, mean, many of them built either by China or Taiwan over the course of the last several years. More recently, almost all uh, uh, by China. What's striking is that they all not only indicate China's interest uh, in the Pacific, which we support, and we recognize that this is a natural uh, thing. And in fact, we welcome a closer dialogue with uh, China on the Pacific, and we want to work with Chinese friends in this regard. But we have to think carefully about how we use, again, scarce resources. In one or two of the island nations that we went to, we saw magnificent buildings that literally local governments are unable to cool uh, uh, in the summer uh, period or heat when necessary because the, uh, the electricity costs, uh, energy costs are so high. So what we're seeking is a more comprehensive dialogue with uh, the key uh, donor nations about um, uh, basically designing approaches that are more relevant and sustainable to uh, given some of the challenges that we're facing uh, in the Pacific as a whole. Um, uh, when we are in, uh, uh, when we are in uh, Auckland, we will have detailed discussions with virtually every country, including uh, China. We'll have discussions with our friends in Taiwan, with India, with Japan, with virtually every uh, country who uh, have strategic interest in the Pacific as a whole. The other thing that you will see that we think is um, basically a continuation of the past, but we want to put an exclamation uh, point on it, is there is a recognition that profoundly and deeply this is in Australia and New Zealand's backyard. Australia and New Zealand have been remarkably supportive of us in areas where we uh, have asked for assistance. This is an area in which their knowledge, their proximity mean that they have real uh, uh, powerful uh, national security and national political interests. And so we are seeking to coordinate more closely and frankly to support Australia uh, and New Zealand more on a range of issues uh, through the Pacific. And one of the things that we have sought to do is to take really uh, very clear and demonstrable steps to improve our uh, dialogue and uh, coordination on these matters. For the United States' sake, we give very substantial resources as part of our compacts to a number of islands in the Pacific. And I think one of the most important things in this current uh, uh, budget uh, uh, season and with this uh, very uh, intense scrutiny is we need to ensure that those resources are spent and used wisely and we are working closely with governments and also with friends in Capitol Hill. Uh, Senator Inouye has been an enormous supporter of our uh, uh, approach to the Pacific, but the, what we have seen in recent uh, uh, years is substantial uh, out-migration from some of these islands to the, to the Hawaiian Islands, and it's put an enormous 
burden on the infrastructure there, and we need to think carefully about what can be done uh, so that, uh, uh, that we can maintain a Pacific in the balance as a whole. I think there's also a recognition, recognition that with scarce resources, but the, the uh, new uh, potential uh, uses of technology, that, that the Pacific, frankly, is ripe for innovation. One of the most innovative things that we've seen that was implemented by the Coast Guard and came up with by a very junior person is this idea of what is called the Shiprider Agreement, which is if a, a national, a law enforcement national from a particular island nation is riding on an American ship, either Coast Guard or Navy, then if we uh, uh, come across uh, uh, an illegal fisher, uh, fisherman, then, then that uh, uh, we will be able to work under a legal uh, framework to take appropriate steps to uh, put in place, uh, uh, you know, uh, legal consequences, fines and the like. That has uh, enabled us to work much more closely with the range of the island nations to improve uh, our ability to patrol these vast areas of space. We're also working, um, uh, again, using technology developed elsewhere in the Gulf uh, to improve maritime uh, domain awareness. It is no longer feasible to have large navies in these small island nations. What we need is a much greater sense of where the challenges are so you can vector small numbers of ships and resources to particular places where you think there might be uh, illegal fishing or uh, uh, problems associated with transshipment of people, you name it, some of the things that we, send, we, uh, we see in the Pacific region as a, uh, as a whole. We also want to look very carefully at what I would call targeted initiatives. We've made clear uh, to Chinese friends that we want to highlight areas where the United States and China are seen to be working closely together. We recognize that when we talk about building trust, you have to build it piece by piece together. And so that requires the United States and China to identify clear areas, whether it's energy efficiency or mangrove planting, where our two countries can be seen uh, uh, to work together uh, for a greater good in terms of the well-being uh, of the lives of the people of the Pacific as a whole. Um, we want to take consequential steps over the course of the next few months uh, uh, to uh, demonstrate our desire to secure the Tuna Treaty. The Tuna Treaty has been one of the most important uh, uh, treaties that helps regulate really what is the last healthy uh, pod of tuna in the world. And it is at some risk now. We want to communicate very, very clearly uh, to the signatories the strong American commitment uh, to see that remain uh, uh, in force. And I want it to be clear, and we'll make it clear when we're uh, in Auckland, of our strong determination to take necessary steps. And we want uh, a reciprocal approach from some of the key countries who are involved in this overall effort. There are a number of places as you, you fly through the Pacific, um, and I'll just give you this contrast if you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, all of you or many of you have been to Europe and have gone to these wonderfully pristine World War II battlefields, these, these you know, manicured lawns. Remember the opening scene of, of Saving Private Ryan, just, just, you know, in which everything is perfect, uh, you know, m wonderful marble columns depicting how various columns and pincer movements played out. You fly through the Pacific and what you are struck with is as if uh, unbelievable carnage and killing. And then when it was done, people got on planes and boats and left. You can find uh, rusted tanks in almost every place where uh, wars were fought during the Second World War. Unexploded ordnance, enormously uh, chilling reminders of war. When we were on, uh, uh, when we were visiting Tarawa Beach, again, one of the greatest scenes of heroism in our history. Uh, to see it, you know, covered in, in garbage and not tended to in the way, uh, frankly, we should, it, it was heartbreaking. But at the same time, when we asked our friends, do you ever find unexploded ordnance? I think that was mis mistaken by our, our, our host, can you find us some unexploded ordnance? <laughs> and within about five minutes, they brought shells and we're like, just, just <laughs> put them down, we'll move away. But we have found some uh, resources. We want to work with our friends in the Pacific and uh, uh, other countries to put back in place some unexploded ordnance initiatives 
That will assist every year. There are tragedies associated with this, and we think this is an important um, uh, uh, legacy issue that the United States has to be uh, engaged with. We're looking closely at, uh, 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 at the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps has substantially downgraded its capabilities and its resources in the Pacific, but uh, we think we have some opportunities here. Uh, every place we go, every place we went in the Pacific, the leaders of every one of these island nations would say, first of all, cannot tell how much we appreciate the Peace Corps for those countries that still had programs and for those countries that no longer had them. The first question was, that, is there anything that we can do to get them back? Clearly, uh, intensity of storms uh, due to climate change and other things are picking up. We need to work more closely with a variety of countries on disaster relief, not just what we do once they happen, but preparing in advance. Uh, this will be a subject of some of our discussions in Auckland over the course of the next couple of days, and also obviously taking whatever steps possible to deal with this remarkable set of challenges associated with energy. Again, more sunlight than basically anywhere else on the planet, uh, less use of renewable energy uh, than almost any other place on the planet. So the challenges are stark. Uh, they are um, uh, troublesome. Uh, but uh, we believe fundamentally that, that a continued effort on the part of the United States, working closely with friends and others who share an interest in the Pacific, that we can make a difference. The key here also, and I'd like to conclude with this, is that li look, we are in a very difficult period uh, domestically, lots of fighting about a lot of issues, but one of the things that we can be grateful for over a period of decades is that we've had a relative commitment to bipartisanship. Uh, in terms of what we've done in uh, Asia and the Pacific. I'm joined here by a very dear friend, Torkel Patterson. Uh, when he was in government, there was nothing more I like to do than to support him. Same with Mike Green. What we need to do is to sustain that overall commitment. To, so no matter who the baton is handed to in the future, that there is a recognition that these issues are profoundly, deeply in the national security, political, moral, and strategic interests of the United States. I recognize that I've skipped over a lot of things, but I want to leave time for questions. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'll look forward to reporting back uh, through Ernie and others what we, uh, what we accomplished when we're out in Auckland. I think I'll take my questions from there, if that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you very much, Kurt. Really appreciate that tour of uh, U.S. strategy in the Pacific. Um, appreciate your taking some questions. Let me just remind everyone, um, we welcome your questions, but please uh, identify yourself and your uh, affiliation uh, when you do so. I think I'll stand up so I don't leave these guys out. First question right here for the gentleman. China has you know, issued a white paper on its uh, peaceful development plan. They, they will not seek hegemony, but will firmly safeguard its national core interests. So I wonder whether you have any comments. Or I haven't had a chance yet. I look forward to reading the white paper actually on the long flights over. I will say generally speaking that I think that uh, our administration, previous administrations have made very clear that it is in the strategic interest of both of our countries to maintain strong, healthy relations. We want to see uh, a China uh, that plays a um, uh, strong, positive role in global politics. I think uh, we welcome uh, deeper engagement on a range of issues, political, security, uh, economic as a whole. I think it is also the case that particularly uh, with respect to uh, security issues, uh, we seek to step up uh, the dialogue between our two sides. And also, uh, uh, we believe that a degree of transparency is a healthy thing uh, in terms of uh, uh, reassuring and communicating clearly uh, 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 intentions and aspirations. But overall, I think we're pleased with the progress in U.S.-China relations, and uh, we welcome the publication of this document. Let me go over here to Stanley Roth. Yeah. 
Polynesia, Polynesia and um, New Caledonia an issue in terms of how the other islands view U.S. policy? Thank you, Stanley, and I appreciate very much uh, uh, the question and the, uh, the, the reference. Um, uh, in almost every place that, we went, that I've gone in the Pacific, uh, the issue of the colonial role of, not, of France but other countries do, uh, does come up. Uh, we've had good discussions with French friends about uh, various aspects of our engagement in the Pacific. I think these issues are less complicated now because of the different set of priorities taken by a succession of French governments on nuclear matters. Uh, and we look forward to consultations with them, for instance, when we uh, sit down over the course of the next couple of days in Auckland. Uh, in the back, gentleman here. Riley, uh, SICE, and the Australian National University. Thank you, Kurt. I think this is a very welcome uh, development. Um, and thanks to CSIS as well for, for, for their related uh, focus on, on the Pacific, which is well overdue. My question is, how realistic is the idea of development cooperation with nations like China, um, amongst others, given that, as you alluded to, a, a lot of the Chinese aid in the Pacific is, is really not developmental in nature. It's, it's prestige projects and it has a strategic dimension. Of course, the, comp the competition with Taiwan is another big issue. So, you know, the, the idea that you will cooperate with China sounds, sounds terrific. Um, there's also the basic problem that for a lot of Pacific governments, the having a, a range of donors competing with each other has, has been very useful over the years because they've got a lot of money out of it. So um, could you address mm -hmm. that issue? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, l let me say that if you look at almost every area of, of success in which the international community has been consequentially engaged in either a development or an assistance project, you see a high degree of coordination and integration. Uh, that coordination integration is generally absent in the Pacific. And so I believe that ultimately it is in the best interest of the Pacific peoples, of their governments, and of the donors as a whole uh, to work more comprehensively together on sector approaches, on looking carefully at what's worked and what has not worked, and also a recognition that you know, prestige projects and, and the like only go so far. There are a number of areas where the United States and China have been able to work together in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. And I have high confidence that if we take this in a sustained and committed way, that working, and it, it won't be just with China, it will be with Japan, with South Korea, that we will be able to find areas that we can work together and that we can demonstrate success. Uh, and, and I believe at a fundamental level that, that there is much basis for for coordination, and I don't believe that there is that much, frankly, to compete over uh, overall. There are a few islands that have some substantial resources, but basically what you have in the Pacific is a series of very difficult and practical problems that sometimes uh, newcomers to the region find out sooner or later. So it's up to us to s see how we can work together uh, to bring, again, limited resources in a way that, that are designed for the betterment of the people. And frankly, there is a lot of waste and there is a lot of misuse that with a more effective approach, I think that, uh, that we can at least improve. Thank you. John San with CTI TV of Taiwan. Mr. Secretary, I have an issue you may find very hard to work with China. Could you uh, uh, update us? on the uh, deliberation or decision on F-16 sales to Taiwan. The clock is, is clicking and uh, the deadline, October 1st deadline set by Secretary Clinton is fast approaching. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your, your question. I think as you uh, well know, and you probably can repeat my uh, line directly back to me, the United States has a national interest in maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. We take those interests uh, uh, very seriously. Uh, we are committed uh, uh, to uh, ta Taiwan's defense, uh, and we uh, support uh, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, and we, frankly, have been very pleased by the positive developments that we've seen over the course of the last few years 
across the Tywin Strait. We'd like that to continue. On specifics, I'm afraid I can't uh, provide anything further, but thanks for the question. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Thank you from Vice of America. Uh, about the democratization process in the Asia Pacific region, we had that uh, U.S. Special Envoy, Mr. Derek Mitchell, is on the way to Burma. Mm -hmm. And do you uh, expect that uh, it, we, it can deliver the message to the Burmese government to better tie with the United States? Or, and any, how do you assess the development inside Burma that you visited last year? First of all, thank you very much again for the question. It's a little further afield from the Pacific, but I'll, but I'll take this on. First of all, very grateful that uh, uh, Derek Mitchell has the chance to travel. This is his first visit as our special envoy uh, uh, for, um, uh, for Burma. Uh, we're looking forward to his uh, deliberations inside country, and frankly, I'm just as anxious as you are to see what his reports are as he emerges from his meetings. I believe he'll be having uh, consequential interactions with both members of the government, and also uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and also representatives from the ethnic groups. I don't think I'd like to characterize any further. I'd like to, frankly, uh, hear what uh, 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 Derek has to say. I will say that we have seen some steps in the last uh, uh, few days that uh, uh, we intend to explore. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary. Um, Tiger Jung from the Stimson Center. Oh, I have two short questions. Mm -hmm. Our first one is, the, uh, what do you see the strategic relationship between the systematic uh, re-engagement with the Pacific and the U.S. re-engagement with Southeast Asia mm -hmm. in terms of the U.S. general policy towards uh, Asia? And the second question is, given the uh, budget cut and bipolar uh, fight in the Congress, what kind of hurdles or struggles do you expect in their support for future programs, yeah. especially USAID? Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent questions. I, I, I would say um, one of the things that I am finding as I, as I you know, consult and talk with friends on Capitol Hill and also allies is I think there is a welcome recognition that our future and frankly, much of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in the Asian Pacific region. And the United States has an incredibly important role to play in that. And I think one of the great challenges of American foreign policy and national security is how we carefully and responsibly rebalance. Tom Donlan, our national security advisor, has talked about rebalancing. Uh, we have enduring security interests, political interests in Europe, and particularly the Middle East. But clearly, um, we will need a, a deeper, more sustained engagement, not just bilaterally, uh, not just with uh, new uh, friends like Indonesia uh, in India, a strong dialogue with China. But one of the things that we have not talked about, which is really a commitment to institutions in Asia and Pacific, that's the reason that we talked about the Pacific Island Forum in November, and I expect Ernie and CSIS will have a session about this later. The United States, as you know, uh, will be uh, uh, joining the East Asia Summit for the first time. We will be holding another of our series of U.S. ASEAN summits. This is, will be our third in the last uh, few years. There are a number of consequential steps that we want to take within these multilateral frameworks with the recognition that if Asia is to play uh, its role, uh, it needs stronger uh, institutions with deeper roots. And the United States wants to support that and, and uh, uh, see what's possible over the course of the next few years, with the recognition that this process will take a substantial period of time. But just to conclude where you began, I, I believe that there will be a strong bipartisan commitment uh, to a stronger U.S. presence in the Asian uh, Pacific uh, uh, region. And I am um, uh, uh, quite... Um, I, I believe in that, and I'm intent on, on seeing that come to pass. Two more. Two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, it was reported U.S., India, and um, Japan um, are going to have a trilateral meeting next month, and you will um, 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 uh, be the leader of the delegation of the U.S. Um, 
could you please confirm this report and uh, what is your um, assessment and how significant is the trilateral relation be among US, Japan, and India? Well, uh, well um, let me just answer the question more generally. So I, I would say that obviously at the, at the heart of our relationship uh, are our bilateral security ties and we have sought to follow on the strong work that President Bush, uh, presidents before him have done to keep those relationships uh, uh, the center, the core of what we've uh, uh, sought to do. In addition, as I indicated, these more formal multilateral uh, engagements, uh, 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 recharging APEC, the East Asia, East Asia Summit, extraordinarily important. One of the other things that, again, have, have we've seen over the course of the last few years is the rise of what one might describe as minilateralism, smaller ad hoc groupings of nations that are designed to tackle particular problems or to increase dialogue or consultation. So for instance, when we were in uh, Bali, uh, we had a very consequential meeting between uh, the United States, uh, Japan, and uh, South Korea. Uh, we uh, want to actually establish a secretariat that will help uh, support the recurring uh, uh, preparation for those sessions. And we've sought other sorts of trilateral engagements and other uh, larger scale uh, efforts. It is our larger goal to do what we can to draw Indian more into the Asia Pacific region, uh, to uh, get them uh, to have uh, successful engagements in multilateral four to play uh, an important role in the trade, strategic, economic uh, uh, interactions in the region as a whole, and to work more uh, closely in the diplomatic uh, context. Um, I'm not going to comment directly um, uh, about the specifics, but we have said that we want to improve coordination between Japan, uh, the United States, uh, and uh, India. I will conclude by saying on this issue that we have had very detailed discussions with Chinese friends about their involvement in a number of these institutions. And we've given them a number of proposals. We'd like very much for Chinese friends to engage in some of these settings because we think that they will help build trust and confidence. We think that they will help us to tackle uh, common problems, transnational challenges and the like. And we think that they send an important message of reassurance in a region that is looking to see that the United States and China understand uh, uh, our responsibilities in terms of demonstrating an ability to work together on important problems. Take one last question. Last question. Thank you, Secretary. I'm Jenny Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Hi. Would you comment about the current posture of China in the South China Sea? How would that affect your initiative in the Pacific. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, well, uh, let me just at, at, a, at a general level, um, the, the way the United States uh, uh, thinks about um, maritime uh, related issues is obviously freedom of navigations, freedom of the seas, maintenance of peace and stability. These are all enduring core values in terms of how the United States uh, sees uh, our role as a whole. I think we were pleased at the first step that was taken in advance of the ASEAN Regional Forum in terms of the understanding that was reached between ASEAN uh, and uh, 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 China. Uh, I think Secretary Clinton said it's a first step, but only a first step. We'd like to see some consequential diplomacy that will follow on from that, hopefully improve trust and confidence in the South China Sea. There's a recognition that these issues must be handled carefully and uh, that by some measures, you know, a third of global commerce passes through the South China Sea. This is already uh, an issue of deep international concern and we want uh, 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 all issues to be handled uh, uh, with a cool head and a strong strategic sense. Okay. Thank you very much, Kurt. Before I close, let me remind you, and I guess this backs, uh, backs up Kurt's assertion, that on Friday, September 9th, uh, we'll be hosting the U.S. Armed Services Ranking Member Adam Smith of Washington State, Congressman Adam Smith, for a policy address entitled America's Commitment to Asia 
and he's going to be talking about how Congress views the role of our armed services uh, in the region and, and that shifting of, of balance that, that you talked about, Kurt. So I hope you'll you'll all join us on uh, on Friday at Can 9 a.m. Can we thank Ernie also for the great work that he and CSIS has done, if we could? Well, I want to I want you to I want to ask you to join me in thanking Kurt Campbell for his uh, <laughs> his great leadership. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it.